Well, uh, let's let's get back to your field of, of expertise. Well, all of these oh, no. are your fields of expertise, but uh, more particularly your MPhil, the visual evocation of the beautiful sublime in Australian Gothic. Um, yes. So maybe you could tell us about this this Australian Gothic atmosphere and especially how you worked with it for Flyaway, because I think you, you put quite a lot of that into the novel by, by design, I'm sure. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so the MPhil, which is, I suppose most most of you will know, <laughs> uh, different from a Master of Arts. So it's a re like a half size PhD. It's a research based mm -hmm. um, degree rather than coursework based. And it was creative practice led. So I was writing fly away novella or a novel, depending on who you ask, <laughs> and illustrating it, and then also doing an exegetical essay about it. And the reason I wanted to write, to do that research is growing up out west, western Queensland on a cattle property, reading fairy tales mm. and getting this really particular combination of visual images and vocabulary together in my head, and then not seeing that reflected in a lot of the books that I was reading at the time. So as well as fairy tales, which, as you can see from my background, I think tend towards the incredibly gothic <laughs> and gothic genres of varying descriptions draw heavily on fairy tales. There was also the sense of, oh, I was also reading like Hound of the Baskervilles and classic ghost stories and stuff and mm -hmm. getting scared in the morning, <laughs> two o'clock in the morning when the dingoes were howling in the hills. <laughs> so I wanted to capture that and that sense of also where I grew up, I thought was beautiful, not just because it was the scene for our Robin Hood games, the scene for our knights and dragons and <laughs> get on a horse or a bicycle and pretend to have a lance and <laughs> all of that. And I wasn't seeing that in a lot of stories, the Australian horror and the Australian Gothic I was reading were very much the dead red heart and decaying civilization and horrible things will get you. I mean, horrible things can get you, but there's a lot of beauty there, which mm. didn't seem to be in that genre. And then as I got older and read more, I realized it was there and mm. that there's this strain of Gothic literature in Australia. The, the concept of Australian Gothic literature is as nebulous as any concept of the Gothic in any particular place <laughs> is. Some say it can't be Gothic because it's in Australia, not Europe. Some people say all Australian Gothic, all Australian literature is Gothic because of the effects of the 19th century on it. Um, there's, you know, issues and resonances and damage and all of that around different uses of the term. But what I was loving was Picnic at Hanging Rock in particular mm. and stories which managed to capture something that Joan Lindsay was picking up there. So in the research, so I was trying to create this effect mm of real beauty, even in a story in which horrible things could happen. And I was looking at a number of books, but particularly Joan Lindsay's novel, Picnic at Hanging Rock, which I, I love. It is a beautiful book. Uh, the Dressmaker by Rosalie Hamm, which there's also a movie of, it's got Kate Winslet in it. And Sean Tan's picture book, Tales from Outer Suburbia. And a number of the stories in that are Australian Gothic, arguably. Mm. And looking at what the patterns there were and how they differed from some other Australian Gothic, in particular, Elizabeth Jolly's novel, novella, The Well, which was interesting because it half did a number of things that those three books were doing, mm -hmm. but it only, it only handled them in a very, I'll tell you what this points out, but it only handled them in a very particular way. And as a result of which it was still, it was still in the other category of Australian Gothic literature, although I gradually came to appreciate the well. I used to dislike it, but it is, it is a very well written book. It's just not quite the subgenre of the Gothic that I love best, I suppose. And what I noticed that they were doing, and which I did to varying degrees in Flyaway because of the stages of writing it, at which I realized these points. So, yes, I was looking at those three books and there were some really interesting patterns in what they did. And one was that they were very particular that beauty was a real and reliable thing. Horrible things happen in these stories. And the Gothic is so much about, you know, appearances being deceiving and doubles and decay and all of this. And 
as a result of which mirror and beauty and so forth is either something to be threatened or to turn out to have like a rotting face behind the beautiful mask or something. And these books were very clear that beauty was beautiful, not necessarily physical beauty, but the landscape, the world, a quality of light. You could rely on that. Uh, horrible things might happen, but that wasn't about to be called into question. And one of the things with the genre is that that pull to make it something you can't trust in is so strong that you really have to outright say, and all these books, do, Sean Tan much more like physically, visually, but they're quite clear that the beauty of the dresses, the beauty of the gold dust flowing across the plains or the beauty of hanging rock and the surrounds are reliable and that there aren't necessarily degrees of beauty in Picnic at Hanging Rock. There's this definite divide between the wild beauty of the rock and all the gardens of the holiday houses that are trying to be very English. They're in the wrong place. They're out of place, but they're not less beautiful for mm. being incongruous. And all of the books are very clear about that. And Joan Lindsay specifically says in Hanging Rock, there's a line, everything if only you could see it clearly enough, it's beautiful and complete. And all of the, all of the stories doubled down on that. Uh, so that was something I was trying to do, like even describing machinery, going back through in Flyaway and editing and making sure I just didn't make mouldering machinery or rubbish heaps ugly by default. Mm -hmm. See if I could find some beauty in that. There's plenty of ugliness in other things. And to describe the trees and the landscape instead of like, ah, oh, the empty trees where nothing is in the red dust. I'm like, I, I love, I love the dust. I remember how fine and powdery it was and the, the way the light falls on things. And that was the next one is that surfaces were really important and that honoring of the surface because it's not something that's going to give way and drop you into a pit of maggots and snakes. <laughs> it, is, it is real. So all of them are very like, again, Sean Tan's paintings largely, but each section in the dressmaker starts with the description of a type of fabric and Joan Lindsay I mean she's very painterly as well but very conscious of specific textures then most of them happen in daylight not exclusively but the dressmaker and picnic at hanging rock in particular almost mm -hmm. entirely daylight Joan Lindsay says at one point in picnic at hanging rock this is a story that happens in daylight <laughs> <laughs> the scenes which is always really interesting with adaptations of it sometimes they'll go oh it's gothic so it all has to be at night whereas the book is so clear that yeah. it isn't as a result of which I've seen one or two productions of it where I'm like I'm enjoying this it's great it's nothing like picking and hanging rock but I really want to see these guys do Dracula <laughs> <laughs> and the last one was using a fairy tale structure or mm -hmm. scaffold around it mm -hmm. and you can do that in horrible horrible gothic as well <laughs> which is still good gothic but you know um there's often fairy tale elements that come through but i find they tend to be a bit fragmented or subverted whereas in the beautiful gothic they tend to follow the story through so the dressmaker has a lot and they'll find the horrific in the fairy tale without necessarily subverting the fairy tale mm -hmm. so the dressmaker has a lot of cinderella but also a lot of thousand furs uh, joan Lindsay has um the Pied Piper, it has, mm -hmm. and other stories which I broadly count as fairy tale ish, like The Little Princess by Frances Hodgson Burnett. And there's a character in Picnic at Hanging Rock who follows through a part of what could have been mm -hmm. Sarah's story and has the same name as Sarah from The Little Princess. So I find, found that really interesting the use of those structures. And as a result of which, you get the eerie, you get the strange, you get the uncanny you get horrific things happening in horrible ways. <laughs> and yet the world that's happening in is very lovely. And there's never a sense that you'll be destroyed by the world or mm -hmm. that you have to overcome the world in order to protect yourself. There's a really interesting sense in a lot of them and also in Judith Wright's poetry. And I love her poetry, this sense that the world could dissolve you, but that is a good thing. And it is better to go willingly into the landscape and vanish into it and let civilization and even the self be stripped away, that that could be a good thing. And even in Picnic at Hanging Rock, everyone who acts that way, nothing horrible, like you could read it that something horrible happens to them, but you never see it. 
and all you see is sort of beauty and light around them. The people who resist it have horrible, or the people who either resist it or who are kept away from it have horrible things happen to them. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who get destroyed by dashing themselves quite literally against the rock or other people sort of just evaporate into the landscape. And I found that really interesting because it doesn't remove that split necessarily between civilization and the wilds, but it changes what is the right response to it. So then I was playing with all of that to varying degrees of success in Flyaway. Well, one of the things I noticed that when I, I noticed when I was reading Flyaway was what, what you mentioned before, the, the fairy tale structure. Uh, and you're, you're uh, bringing in the Pied Piper as well. Um, and the, the Seven Ravens, which is something that, that I'll come back to in the, the question after this one. But uh, why do you think fairy tales are still so appealing and um, what, what, what happens to European fairy tales if you read them in Australia or write them? <laughs> so I guess for the first part or even before the first part there's the definition of fairy tales which is uh, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm doing a guest lecture or a guest conversation for a subject at university and I'm really worried they're expecting me to be very academic about it because I'm fascinated by the academics around fairy tales and the discussions. And I love reading all of the really academic stuff and running off and using that as story ideas. <laughs> but I think for me, like defining fairy tales, I define fairy tales as anything that's commonly defined as a fairy tale. And then I'm kept cautious about the fringes of it where it bleeds over into what are cultural stories or religious traditions where clearly it's getting out of fairy tale realm. But I sort of feel like a fairy tale is anything that's used as a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. So there are ones that have always been fairy tales and there's ones that are urban legends which get into a fairy tale space that stop when a particular technology that made sense of that story stops working. So there's, I think there's urban legends which had fairy tale status which are disappearing now that people don't have like landline telephones to be like hiding under the desk <laughs> answering <laughs> it. Uh, so so I do define it for my own purposes fairly broadly. And as you saw, I, there's things that to me feel like fairy tales because they have that fairy tale mythic quality. So uh, Frances Hudson Burnett, A Little Princess, clearly draws heavily on fairy tales. So to me, it feels fairy tale-ish. Mm. And sometimes it gets into those conversations in some workshops with story and imagery. I'll define it even more broadly. And it's sort of any story template that means a lot to the people in the workshop. So it could be Little Red Riding Hood, it could be Die Hard, it could be Jurassic Park. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've had people do fascinating things with Dracula and Peter Pan in a workshop like that, neither of which are really traditionally fairy tales, but both of which easily get into that space when you're playing with them practically. So I guess that's the first step. The, I think the appeal of them is partly that they're in a sense small enough they're an idea that's just the right size to hold in your head and tell in a sitting. Mm. So all the details of Dracula, if you're, if you're counting Dracula as one of your personal fairy tales, it's probably not all the details. It's probably the aesthetic and a couple key scenes, but it's also the aesthetic and a couple key scenes that you're going to hold from Cinderella, mm -hmm. which means that it's really good for telling people, remembering and retelling to people, adapting on the fly, uh, fan fiction versions, and then just the fact that there's probably always has been to an extent, if you include professional storytellers in various capacities, but certainly for a couple centuries, three, four centuries, an industry involved in and interested in perpetuating the idea of fairy tales, retelling stories, passing them along, collecting them in an academic sense, making movies of them, whatever. And I think all of that, I, I I love the idea from, from a writing perspective, I love the idea of stories that sort of start in the human hind brain and are part of our DNA template and get out and do stuff because that sounds like a wonderful thing to write a horror story about. My personal more practical take is just, I think Little Red Riding Hood survives not because of what it says about femininity and so forth, but because at some point you can jump out and say, and the wolf ate them all up. And then whoever you're telling the story to screams and then you <laughs> to bed and they have nightmares like I think that is probably a large part of the appeal of stories like that but because that appeal endures all of the other 
variations, versions, riffs, refinements um, mm. survive around that and don't last as long. But that kernel sort of keeps getting passed mm -hmm. from hand to hand. So that's my that's my personal working definition. It's not particularly scholarly. Um, so that was, I think that was the first part of your question. What was the second part? Um, what, what changes about European fairy tales in an Australian context, both reading and writing them? I think that it becomes much easier, certainly being in an Australian context, and obviously there are many, <laughs> there are Australian <laughs> stories and so forth, but specifically being in an Australian context, being from by various paths, a broadly European background um, and using European stories. It is quite interesting. I mentioned the landscape aspect because I think it's a lot easier to accept them as that sort of universality of the fairy tale. And I have a sneaking suspicion that some of the conversation around that relates to people being more and more removed from the places where the story is being told. Mm -hmm originally so there's less of that sense of no this is a story about this particular rock <laughs> it's always been about this particular rock instead it becomes about the concept of rocks in general mm. and it's much much easier you have no other way of taking it really if you're reading stories in Australia until you go and visit the place and you're like oh that's the rock <laughs> it all makes so much sense now but it also is quite fun because it frees you up to do stuff with the stories. Unfortunately, that also can give you the habit of being cavalier with other people's stories. So I do broadly try to stick to stories which I have in one respect or another, some broad cultural heritage around, because um, there's plenty of stories that aren't mine to tell or certainly aren't mine to riff on or try and reimagine. And so that's, that's one aspect is what stories mean about being divorced from the landscape. That's super interesting, again, as a European in Australia and taking into account the realities of what that means and colonial history and everything else, but also growing up on the land, introduced species of all kinds are such a regular part of life and narrative and story. And there's the skeleton, the fibrous skeletons of prickly pear cactus all over the landscape and it used to be so dense it rendered huge huge areas mm. of Queensland unusable uh, and it was imported to grow cochineal beetles on to make red dye for British army uniforms among other things also for decorative purposes and so forth so Joseph Banks um, and then the stories of the different ways that people tried to com combat that and what they brought in and what finally worked so which obviously presents itself very easily as an analogy for certain things and I love it as an analogy for stories and what happens if you transplant a story to a landscape where it doesn't belong is it going to wither and die is it going to change is it going to elbow out what grew there first um, is it going to grow rampantly in ways no one ever expected and take over the landscape and destroy thousands of acres and livelihoods? So you, you don't really know. It's, it's always exciting. Uh, very, <laughs> I'm always reading stories and stuff. I'm like, but what about biosecurity issues? <laughs> <laughs> I went to Isla and they're like, well, we want to protect our horses. You have to declare if you've been in farmland. And I've been in Dartmoor. And they're like, oh, that's fine. You can come in. I was like, but I've been near horses. And they're like, it's fine. I was like, please take my boots and wash them. Burn them if you have to. <laughs> really yeah really interested in that and it was I suppose there are lots of lots of issues particularly with white treatment of indigenous people and the massacres and so forth that have happened and the events that are still happening in Australia which I was really worried that I wouldn't be able to cope to deal with or reflect sensitively or so forth in the story but I couldn't avoid I couldn't write it out mm. um, there was some interesting questions there but one of the reviewers was saying that it was a very critical look at Australia and I was thinking I'm like I'm glad it felt critical it's nice <laughs> yay <laughs> I didn't think I'd got away with it to that degree but also how little how little has to be done to be critical of something and just saying, huh, sometimes if you bring a plant in without thinking about how it's going to grow in the place that you're introducing it to, that can turn out badly. 
can be revolutionary. <laughs> I, <suppose. laughs> I found that really interesting. I, I love I love the possibilities and metaphors for it, particularly with that sense of displacement of, of having of belonging to a culture that is actively and continually actively displacing another, but at the same time of not quite belonging to any of the cultures that my family came from because I am not Amer I'm not English, I'm not Irish, and like, there's no way really to go back to as such. There's as interesting tensions, mm -hmm. uh, and you have to trace stories back. There's places where you can't take stories back to because they don't exist that way anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and what happens to those stories then if you take them back but it is really interesting I was on a panel about lore and fairy tales with a number of New Zealand writers at Worldcon and it was quite interesting talking to them because you've got that sense in a lot of fantasy and fairy tales of the fae or of the she or of the you know the other world and this is an interesting point of difference I think in some countries and potentially in Australia if you're telling that sort of story in an English setting, then often the fae or the she are the people who were there before. Mm -hmm. If you're telling it in an Australian setting, they're the people who came after. Mm -hmm. And all that sense of power and law and contracts and bargaining and stealing people away and inflicting things on people and curses and so forth reads very differently if you've stumbled into their territory and they do it to you and you misguidedly start making pacts with the Fae, it reads very differently than if the Fae arrive in your country and start making pacts with you and expecting firstborns and so forth. And yeah, it just, I haven't seen anyone take some of that to its literal obvious conclusions. And mm. I don't think it would, I think it would be extremely difficult to do sensitively but I think there is a an awareness of perhaps a treading around that rather than a dealing with it in a lot of Australian and New Zealand fantasy possibly American Canadian I'm not sure but just because the European history there is a little a couple of centuries further begins a couple of centuries further back there's just different approaches and nuances to that mm -hmm. It's, it's interesting and it's difficult and it's important and I do mm. not have the answers but I'm fascinated when I see someone asking the questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, great answer, thank you. And something else I did want to say really quickly yes. is I, that's probably one of the reasons with Fly Away that I wasn't, I didn't at any point want to go this story or this sub story or this chapter is a direct retelling of this particular mm. fairy tale. Mm. That can be done beautifully and direct one for one tellings can be also a lot of fun. I don't particularly <laughs> enjoy doing them myself. I like taking it and letting it, putting a story into a new situation and letting it grow and see what, mm. see what goes wrong, see what happens. So nearly, I think every, every story in Fly Away that is partly the Pied Piper is also partly Sleeping Beauty is also partly the history of prickly pear and lantana in queensland and if it's partly little red riding hood it's also going to be partly tamlin and if it's partly blood earth it's also going to be partly etc 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 and like mix them cross them let them grow in one of our email exchanges you mentioned how you took the name bettina yes <laughs> from a version of the fairy tale the seven ravens that you read mm -hmm. Um, I'll show you the copy. Sorry, you can ask the question first. Yeah, but I definitely want to see that because I didn't, I couldn't find a version of that that had the name Bettina. So I'm really interested to that. Um, the question is more, um, well, just want to know what your experience was first reading that fairy tale and, and how you then wove certain elements into Fly Away. I'm going to turn off my background so I can show you the book. <laughs> This book, World's Greatest Fairy Tales, which I think it's an Italian publishing house originally, obviously English translation, I think from America, my older sister would have had it. It's, it's got some of my favorite, oh, it's got some of my favorite quality of a fairy tale illustrations. And I just always loved, if you can see Cinderella's dress there. Yes. And the light and the weight and the color. But anyway, that's not what you asked. <laughs> but it's great 
And it's probably going to turn out, honestly, you know, I, I looked at this earlier this year and I could have sworn it said Bettina, but it's Bertina. <laughs> B-E-R-T-I-N-A. So after all of this, I was convinced it was Bettina for years. And so it's the, mm. the seven ravens. Oh, those are lovely ravens. <laughs> they are great. And it has, let me see if the mother in it, when she gets annoyed at her son's because I wish you'd all turn into ravens and fly away. Mm -hmm. She just, there was again that it's very much, you can see it's a fairy tale illustration. Mm -hmm. And, and yet there's this very recognizable humanity and just something that the way her hair is sort of cropped short and it's just a little around her face and is a little un, unstudied and not too beautiful. And that sense of, I think I've always been fascinated by a sense of duty in stories of people not doing things because they want a particular outcome or object. Although I suppose wanting to do the right thing is, is still a desire, but I'm fascinated by that as a motivation in the story and people who, people who are motivated by wanting to do the right thing or being seen to be doing the right thing, or I'm reading a Georgette Hare novel at the rereading at the moment, in some cases, taking such offense to being seen to be doing the wrong thing that they proceed to do the wrong thing out of spite <laughs> to prove everyone else right wrong I'm not sure it's a great yeah I really like that sense of people who do things because they believe it is right and necessary and might wear themselves out or cross mountains on foot and work their fingers to, you know all those fairy tale elements mm. I think not in that particular edition of it but in a lot of versions of it she carries a chair with her wherever she goes and I think she also has to cut off her finger to open it mm. as a key to use as a door in the mountain when she's going to find her brothers and it's it's a funny one it's I think it's the mother's exasperation and Bettina's doggedness which is two emotions you didn't really see as motivating or instigating forces in fairy tales a whole lot <laughs> Uh, and that sense, which is something that comes up so much in Diana Wynne Jones's books, that just saying a thing can have a magic. I wish you'd all turn into ravens and fly away. You're annoying me so much. And it's such, it's the sort of thing someone would say. And then it happens. And in, in Howl's Moving Castle, Diana Wynne Jones, Sophie talks to hats is the name of, I think, the first chapter. And she's always talking to hats and going, oh, you know, you'll marry money and so forth. And then it starts happening to the people who wear the hats. <laughs> I love that. I love that idea that the almost mon the fabulous possibilities of the mundane. I love mm -hmm. that. And which is so close to the uncanny, really. Uh, you start talking to things and they start doing what you tell them to. So, yeah, just doing what you have to do. And then once you start having to go through to the end, which is something I actually love about endurance novels, <laughs> like, <laughs> like Lord of the Rings and Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell and Connie Willis's time travel stuff. Like I love that sense of like, oh no, the gears have started turning and you are now caught in this and you just have to keep walking forward until you, the only way out is through, which is a line from a Robert Frost poem, which I also, Robert Frost and Judith Wright's poems get into a lot of my stuff as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what always stuck with me from that story, Bettina on the Hills and her mother's exasperation. And I would never have said it was my favourite fairy tale at all. And it's certainly not the prettiest illustrations in that. There's no fine clothes or beautiful castles or anything. And yet it just stuck there. I think so. <laughs> something about being exasperated with your siblings as well, probably. Not just the parental exasperation, but like, <sighs> now she has to go hunt down her brothers. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I love that. And it's Flyaway is not the first story that it's got into uh, my story, um, Skull and Hyssop, which uh, Small Beer Press, Lady Churchill's wristlet, Rosebud Wristlet came out in and then in Prime Books Year's Best that year is also a very different, it's, it's not not steampunk, but I wanted to write a steampunk story that felt blue and white and breezy instead of brown and copper. Mm. It's got airships. And I sort of sat down and wrote the story. And that's a funny one because it started with a picture of a ship's figurehead that I wanted to draw and wrote the story. And it was all there and it didn't quite have life. It didn't, there was something wrong. It wasn't quite standing on its own legs yet. 
and I ended up and I do this for a lot of stories now really quickly jotting down like four or five points descriptions de-identified descriptions of my favorite fairy tales like uh, desire unwise trade isolation something that grows out of control uh, rescue quest you know whatever and whenever I do that it's just how I feel about a particular fairy tale at the time so that's Rapunzel I did that for about four or five fairy tales and just sort of held them up to the story I'd written. I was like, which one feels most like it? And mm. it was Seven Ravens. I was like, it was all the shape of it was almost all there. And it's a, it's a story about tracking down family members and great heights and traveling. And so it was just almost a matter of going, lying the, putting the two alongside each other and then like a splint or like training a plant to, to a growing frame, just attaching it at a couple points going okay here's where I'm missing an emotional beat that's in the fairy tale here's where okay I want it to end more like this maybe with more exhaustion than with jubilation uh, and just doing that brought it together and that's one of the things I find fairy tales hugely useful for is there's all those you know the 36 plots the 36 dramatic situations and the seven plots and three act structure five act structure all of that which are great but I think they're less universal rules than the best way a particular person was able to explain to themselves how a story works mm -hmm. and if you study them enough it starts to usefully explain to you how stories work I've never been able to commit to any of them enough so I, I look at them I'll use them I'll use them as diagnostic tools I find them interesting for coming up with ideas but for me fairy tales are much more I read them so much I think about them so much that it's instinct so it's instead of going ah oh, you know what did the character want did they get it what did the character need or what are the you know scene changes in this are the act changes in this just to go which fairy tale does this look most like and where does it not have the same shape and maybe if I knock that into shape, <laughs> everything else will everything else will come together, and it usually does. And especially for short stories, fairy tales are often a size that adapts fairly well to a longish short story mm -hmm. if you're changing things. Mm -hmm. But they also expand quite easily to novel length. And one of my other favorite favorite novels is Charles Dickens' Our Mutual Friend, and it's. I always thought I was just making it up, but it is very consciously. I might be making up that it's a Little Red Riding Hood story, but there's definitely <laughs> explicit Little Red Riding Hood references through it. Mm -hmm. I remember reading it going, there's so many references to wolfish expressions and red rust stains. If this were a modern writer, I'd think it was Little Red Riding Hood. And then at some point a character turns around to another and says, I thought you were a kindly old, fair, I thought you were a kindly old grandmother, but you're not, you're a wicked wolf. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> it's deliberate. And then there's a chapter named after the Feast of the Three Hobgoblins, which is a version of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Mm. There, there's a scene in which someone says, you have to trust me, I can't tell you my secret. And she calls him a bluebeard. And then they're going up the stairs and he has to keep telling her to be brave. And then she has to guess her husband's real name three times. Like that doesn't happen <laughs> accidentally. And in Dickens' case, like there's explicit references to the fairy tales. But I just love the structural possibilities and something even though the PhD is jurisprudence in fantastic story worlds, what started me on that is the way contracts work in fairy tale fantasy mm. and how without the author creating an entire legal or bureaucratic system, and there are fascinating fantasies which do that, you can set an entire plot in motion with a contract, which is really neat because you can still have antagonists, but you don't need them. Mm -hmm. It's about coming of age in some respects, because in most places you have to be a certain age to be able to enter into a binding contract. It can be a marriage contract. It can be a business contract. It can be a contract with the Fae. It can be about learning to watch your words or learning to argue better. There's all these interesting possibilities for that. So, yeah. And I think when I first encountered Seven Ravens, it was obviously very early on in my that's a very old fairy book <laughs> in my fairy tale reading. It's stuck with me for those, I think, images of the humanity. And then yeah, it just keeps coming back along with other stories as, as something that gives shape and life to other ideas. So talking about elements that come up again in your stories, uh, I was reminded of your short comic, A Small Wild Magic. 
because it's also about an, an animal that gets turned sort of humanish, and in that it's it's a kind of reversal of the, the seven ravens as well. So, what is it that fascinates you about that trope? I always thought if I have an anthology, if I have a collection of my own stories at some point, it's not going to end up being called this, but I wanted to call it at one stage, the coats of beasts and men. <laughs> and I just liked, ah, I don't know, the, the possibilities. It's almost like if, if you tell a hat that it will have a certain effect on a person and then it does have that person. If you talk to an animal and it answers back, it's, it's just near enough what's imaginable. Mm -hmm. it's not far future science fiction or high tech or mm -hmm. complicated magic systems it's just a thing that's very easy to imagine and which could be scary or which could be awesome so I love the possibilities of that sorry can you ask that question again <laughs> <laughs> I completely got sidetracked by talking dogs <laughs> Well, uh, the question was mostly about a small word magic because yeah. it, it reminded me of Flyaway in that we have this this animal turned human but only humanish. Yes. And I was just wondering why that's so fascinating. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, well, clear, clearly it is fascinating because I managed to completely sidetrack myself by contemplating <laughs> the possibility of it. Uh, oddly enough, it's not it's not really that big an element in a lot of the fairy tales I love and mm -hmm. if it is it's usually an animal that talks that comes along and goes okay now that I've done all of this great stuff for you you have to cut off my head <laughs> and it's like I hate that it's one of the things I hate in fairy tales I don't think I've done it in this story yet I'm like, why I know it's a test and I know it's the only way to become human again but I feel like you could communicate this fact more clearly. <laughs> it stresses me out um so it's just quite funny but that sense of creatures that could talk Mm -hmm. I love the idea of possibly some of those books books you read when you're smaller about you know the borrowers sure. or something about people who are really small or about talking animals and that sense of when you're little and spend a lot of time lying on the floor imagining you could walk under the fur furniture or lying in the grass and can imagine more easily what it is to be just that little bit smaller and adults mm -hmm. are so much bigger mm -hmm. I love that slight shift in perception that's possible and I thought of one I like, Snow White and Rose Red, that fairy tale with the bear. Yes. Uh, that's, that's one of the ones I loved and the sense that perhaps, perhaps the horrible old woman who comes to the door and demands shelter is actually a fairy in disguise and will curse you or give you largesse. But perhaps the animal that comes to your door is a person who needs help and can't communicate that. Uh, is another one that I really like and I'm not 100% sure why that fascinates me I think some of that sense of not just sympathy or empathy but also kindness of doing the right thing mm -hmm. and of doing it the right thing at the risk that it could hurt you mm -hmm. or that it might not benefit you but that it's still a good thing to do anyway and that parallel in fairy tales of if you drop breadcrumbs for the ants they might help you gather the seeds that you need to fulfill a quest and if you feed the ducks then they might dive in the lake for the keys and that sense of you don't know how this it, it may never pay off but you do the right thing anyway and sometimes in unexpected like how when are we going to get ourselves into a situation where we have to pick which of three draped figures in a palace as the princess and which of the dragons <laughs> but but the sense that if if you did get yourself into that situation, it won't have hurt to have been nice to people on the way. <laughs> and that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I love the story idea of that. And so perhaps that sense of, mm. and I love the visuals of transformation mm -hmm. with the caveat that they almost always freak me out in movies. And I have seen very few werewolf transformation sequences that I enjoy watching. <laughs> but the possibilities of it and the sense of something changing size rising up shrinking down and i thought of another reason that it's important to me um the sword in the stone the novel of the sword in the stone where arthur gets as a boy gets changed by merlin into all the different animals and experiences being in that state and seeing through those eyes and swimming through the moat and so forth um, yeah just I, I love that and playing with it yeah <laughs> 
but in fairy tales and, and also the stories you mentioned, it's it's quite often the human that gets turned into an animal. And here in a small world magic, and spoiler, also fly away, <laughs> it's the other way around. And it's, they're not particularly pleased to be human. So what why is that? <laughs> I think that was an echo and another story that comes up in a few places that's an echo of versions of what I loved about first reading Aladdin's Lamp is that sense of something trapped in an unassuming form and then if you let it out it could help you it could harm you it could be incredibly powerful and that very much is the case in Small Wild Magic it is that sense of rub the lamp, a genie comes out, lift up the stone, find a creek, you know, reach into the lake, find a fish that will give you three wishes. Um, <laughs> what's going to happen to you once you use them? Do usually wish associated mayhem. <laughs> but yeah, I just like, I really like that sense of, yeah, that other aspect. Yes, there's the kindness to the creature you meet on the road, but there's also the sense that something that's just near you could suddenly emerge and make demands. Mm -hmm. or expect to have demands made of it and strike out preemptively mm -hmm. which is probably not unlike dealing with wild animals <laughs> in some respects so that sense of yeah here's a thing from the perspective of playing with fairy tales it's really interesting to turn the wheels instead of starting with the person and then following the story until they turn into an animal and then back into a person it's quite fun to start when they're already an animal and turn it until they turn back into a person and they're really annoyed and then you can get the backstory later on. <laughs> uh, and usually they've grown as a person by that stage. So yeah, I think there's a few reasons. It's narratively interesting. Uh, it's surprising. It's visually appealing. Mm -hmm. I gave a reading once. I wasn't expecting to have to give a reading because I'd written a comic uh, and mm -hmm. I ended up giving a reading of it at a bookstore in New York and in advance I had to scramble and essentially novelize part of a small wild magic so that I could read it without visual aids and that transformation sequence where the bird drops out of the cage and changes over a couple of panels trying to work out how to capture that same timing mm. in written or at least spoken word was quite fun. Uh, so um, the next question is about your short story Undine Love. Yes which I really enjoyed. Um, and in the introduction to it on Tor.com, where I read it, you talk about uh, reading Gothic fiction as in the 18th century, 19th century kind of stories where, and this is roughly quoting you, people get dragged into hell or are wrestling anacondas. <laughs> and so I was wondering, uh, what do you think is the relationship between that kind of gothic and the Australian gothic? And then you've also talked about different kinds of Australian gothic. So I was just wondering what, what your feelings are on that or your thoughts. Uh, it was fairly, I mean, not super recently, but recently than it, more recently than it should have been that I discovered what actual, actual gothic literature, gothic literature was like. I had an idea. I had the received idea. I had because Gothic literature has been mocked almost before there was Gothic literature. So you've got this idea of it and so much was filtered through Sherlock Holmes and things like that as well. The way so much Gothic gets into crime novels. Mm. And then I was reading a lot of Australian and some American. And then I actually picked up a book of short Gothic short stories from like the 17 and 1800s. I'm like, what is, what is happening? People are literally getting dragged to hell. They really are. <laughs> They're in salon battling anacondas. No one told me that, you know, this is this is what Jane Austen's characters are reading. This is a story that was written at a time that, well, I personally, having realised that Mary Bennett in Pride and Prejudice quotes Evelina, um, I choose to believe that this is what Mary Bennett was secretly reading, but probably more likely. <laughs> Some of the other, <laughs> other Jane Austen's people were... Um, reading books like this this belongs to the same era and I just found that fascinating it cracked me up so that's yeah the whole history and spreading out of the concept of the gothic is really interesting and one of the things I find particularly fascinating is like a lot of literature on the gothic in Australia is really focused on what was happening in the 19th century and taking that as a point for defining the genre as it goes on mm 
but obviously the longer a genre goes on not only does it change and it'll go into film for a bit and then it'll get back mm. into literature and so forth but also it's starting to respond to what did happen but also to the memory of what happened so you get serious books that are responding to a culturally or say mockery of a particular version of the gothic but technically the mocking versions of the gothic are often pretty gothic themselves they're just having more fun with it but then you read the old gothic you're like you can't write a story about someone getting dragged to hell and or ba battling a giant anaconda and and not be having a good time and i think that's always been built into the gothic is people are having the time of their lives <laughs> and I like that but so there's that aspect of you know, how do you define it and is it about is it about the displacement of the colonizer finding themselves in this unfamiliar landscape finding themselves in this unfamiliar <laughs> landscape oh no how did this happen <laughs> can it still be about that if it's a living genre that's 200 years 300 years 400 years after that uh, there's a lot of conversation about whether there can be an indigenous gothic um clearly mm. there is because there are a lot of indigenous writers who refer to their work as gothic or as indigenous gothic um it depends a lot on what you're doing with your definitions mm. as well but then how does that feed in how are we afraid of the other in the landscape or are we doing something slightly less early 19th century with this book and who's doing it and who's it being done to so that's that's one whole and really interesting avenue um, how do we see the landscape is the landscape something to fear or is the landscape something that should fear us or is the landscape something that's going to rise up because we've made it fear us and it has to defend itself or and what happens after that so there's that aspect the other thing is that so much literature about the gothic talks about decay and decadence and ruins and mad monks and all of this and yes I can see an argument that that was not visually appealing at the time except that clearly everyone was having such a great time reading and writing it I don't think it was purely because it was ugly like there's that wild there's a certain thrill about reading it <laughs> But the further you get from that, the more it becomes a visual vocabulary that's divorced from maybe I don't know what it's like to live in a half ruined big house with rising damp, but I know what the pictures of it look like and the greenery of it or the mist. And that can be incredibly beautiful if your tastes from that one run to the Gothic. So now you have a Gothic literature which is using those visuals, but as something beautiful. So it's really quite interesting looking at, say, Australian Gothic which is looking at the Australian landscape and going, what, what are the parallels to the ruined castle? Okay, mm -hmm. it's these rocks and instead of horrible cold, we'll have horrible heat. So that's taking one particular view of it, but you can also go beautiful castles and greenery and mystery and mist and possibilities, which is the same set of visuals, but just interpreting it a different way. Okay, so where are those parallels in the Australian landscape? What am I doing with the possibility of the beautiful? Or what am I doing with that sense of a place where a place where people have history, mm -hmm. as opposed to a place where history is crumbling or perceived to be absent? So there's some there's a lot of different avenues you can follow that through. And and then of course you've got pop gothic and the the gothic aesthetic and that sense, you know, what Guillermo del Toro does, which is incredibly beautiful and it's almost horror it's like yes it's horror we're going to put some really scary ghosts in it but as crimson peak is crimson peak is never about the ghosts and it says it's like there's a line in the movie it's not about the ghosts and by the time you get to the end you're like oh wow it really wasn't about the ghosts <laughs> they're just hanging out <laughs> so yeah no I, I i really like stuff that i really like works that manage to capture that sense not just of this is horrible so we're going to make everything horrible or this is beautiful so we're going to make everything beautiful but mm. this could be beautiful and scary at the same time so i enjoy that but you do see it fall out in really interesting ways i have some of the i haven't read hugely southern um, a huge amount of southern gothic but having a couple of hundred years of the european history side of it on australia it's really interesting to see how the genre has developed once you get into those all those aspects mm. thus you know 
all those different layers, different cultural, different history, but also something in a lot of Southern literature is that sense of being, of the landscape being threatening, especially once you get into swamps and things, but of the landscape being a place that is seen as hideous by outsiders and that therefore even if it is threatening to you it is still yours and you defend at least to the reader as a place that has beauty mm. and history and magic as well as terror and death and other possibilities and I find that particular tension really interesting. Mm. Um, also in Undine Love uh, you bring up another aspect in, into this whole dynamic I'd say which is that of the introduced species and you've you've already touched upon that uh, early on when we talked about flyaway I think it was mm. and I thought that was that was so interesting to see the stories and fables as literal introduced species and so I think you mentioned it also in the introduction to that story that <laughs> people keep telling you they want to hear more about that and I, I completely agree with that. I want to know uh, what are your thoughts on, on what else is there that the Damsons in particular are keeping Australia safe from? And what, what other introduced species do we have? Is there a backstory as to why the Damsons do that? Um, and also maybe you could elaborate a, a little more on the, on the implications of the, the mythical introduced species. <laughs> So to the extent I touched on it already, there's that really interesting parallel between the introduced species and the introduced story and the self-introduced, self-seated people and culture. <laughs> really interesting. And I find the difficulty of the impossibility sometimes of eradicating introduced species, the necessity of managing it, the way they can incorporate themselves into the landscape and suddenly you have new situations which wouldn't have existed without them, which have to at least be taken into account if you're trying to undo things. I find all of that really interesting and it's such an intriguing model in its possibilities for the storyteller when you're dealing with themes that might be very fraught mm -hmm. or difficult for a particular author to answer or mm -hmm. to deal with that sense of rather than leaving a question hanging or not dealing with it it can provide I think an interesting model for dealing with difficult situations because of the way it's a tension that exists in the world and can't perhaps be satisfactorily solved. You could solve it if you could go back in time and stop that plant, turn that boat around, stop that animal getting off the boat, you know. But if you can't do that, what do you do next? And so it is, it is quite an interesting way to play with the possibilities around that, especially if you're not qualified or don't have the standing to tell a particular story it's a way to at least acknowledge aspects mm. of it hold a door open for other stories so um I always feel I'm not I'm not doing enough I'm not saying enough in that capacity but I feel like there's potential there and a way to hold a sort of suspension in the story without resolving it uh, so as a result of which I find it really interesting to put in stories and have people try to deal with it so what I particularly enjoy about writing the Damson family somewhat somewhat obliquely like in in both Fly Away and in Undying Love you only really see one of them mm -hmm. you're aware of others and what they've said and stories they've told but it's all related or heard through a telephone or something something I like about that is that they haven't got the answers either but they're very sure what the right thing to do is and going back to Fly Away obviously that sense of it's the right thing to do so we do it I think is great and admirable and interesting story but can also be a little bit pig-headed and it's an excuse for not examining what you're doing if you know it's right so you keep doing it uh, it's, yeah so uh, in undying love she is dealing a lot with the question of what the right thing to do is and why mm -hmm. that is and she's perhaps not that young like she's clearly an adult it's owns property or is it managing property <laughs> but, um, but she's still working out her position in the world where mm. everyone else in her family has very has very occasionally pat answers about what to do which is a fun fun thing to deal with You're like everything's going wrong it's like no you just do what we told you You're like it's not working <laughs> uh classic slapstick plot and in 
uh, fly away there's a bit less of that except I think Gary's the only person of the trio who you're pretty sure has a strong idea of what is going mm. on yes but he's not unaware that his family has contributed to what is going on by refusing to stop it going on <laughs> and by sticking very particularly to what they see as their their work mm. which is managing fences and boundaries which uh, a book that had a bit of an influence on me is one called by Frank Dolby, Dav Dolby Davidson and it's mm, not <laughs> man shy and it is the story of a cow a, a cow that is fairly wild in Australia obviously I mean it's an introduced species but in the days before there were many fences on the farms and then it's following what's happening to a feral animal essentially as as these fences get put in place and as human history moves along what's happening to animals that are themselves introduced species so i have not read it for years it reminds me of what i remember bambi the felix sultan novel being like which is that there's no personification of the animals i could be wrong about bambi but certainly in frank dobby davison it's just a novel about a cow that's a cow it doesn't talk it's not personified <laughs> it's it's very cow like cow and what stuck out in that book was the sense of fences mm -hmm. and fences as actually being a problem, yeah. which is interesting because I was growing up on the farms and boundaries and I love contracts. I love property law. I was a lawyer for a while. That makes sense. Main, mending fences, repairing fences, um, Robert Frost, mending walls, good fences make good neighbors and all of that. But there's something that constantly needs to be fixed. They're not a natural feature. Uh, Australia has a very fraught history of fences as well. Interesting one, the, the dingo fence and the rabbit proof fence and attempts mm -hmm. to manage native and introduced species uh, and then how those fences go into the folklore of the folklore and the cultural history of a country. It's really, really interesting. <laughs> but obviously if you're imposing fences on a landscape, then it's creating havoc in what was there and it's taking ownership of something where there was free passage or prior ownership mm. uh, even just in relation to animals as a poem I don't recall who it's by probably someone famous like Banjo Patterson but I feel like it's a tiny <laughs> bit later and it involves a farmer's ongoing struggle with wombats going through and destroying the fences until the farmer finally gives up at the end of the poem and rigs a little swinging gate to let the wombat through <laughs> as it bows to that force of nature. So it's just, ah, it's interesting. And because it's not, and I've known a lot of people who fence either because they're farmers or sisters, one of my sisters, I, early boyfriends worked on some fencing contracts for the government. So I remember com like coming across his name in a document about someone getting new fences put in their property when a water pipeline was being built. And I was there because I was seconded from the law firm I was working at because of my property law experience, so all of that coming together and that sense of fences being a thing people do. It's a job that's earthy and respectable, but it's not without questions as to what purpose it serves and what you're fencing in and what you're fencing out and what washes up against a fence in a flood and who's responsible for repairing it. Again, there's a lot of like, quite literally tension in the case of offense, but a lot of tension around those questions. And I liked that idea of the Damsons being broadly sympathetic or at least appealing as a family. I, I like them, but I also like being able to write them in a way that perhaps they don't always ask the questions that could be asked and they get away with it. And they're fairly to an extent respected and have standing in the community that comes from not asking if they should be doing their job or not. Mm -hmm. So I just, I uh, just like all the possibilities of that. <laughs> and I oh, love the absolutely. swoop of a fence when you're driving, driving long distances and watching the fences. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really hoping that we'll get to read more about the Damsons. Uh, <laughs> Cause I also, I really like them and I could specifically relate to that scene in Undying Love where she's at the, I think she's at the dam and she, she just remembers who this person is. Mm. 
and remembers that she's been leaving leaflets about uh, swimming in the dams and making jokes about ghost stories to him. And that was so that was so inherently relatable. This this moment of, oh no, <laughs> what have I done? I'm glad because I do love. I I like her. I something I love going back and revisiting that story mm. for when it came out on tour dot com was just going through and that feeling that I wasn't writing a romance but that sense of being a person who is still to an extent hasn't committed to a course of action entirely in the world and the way you kind of everyone who comes into your life is a possibility not necessarily for romance but for something it could be for something going horribly wrong and misinterpreting that or misreading it or just the not wanting to act on possibility, but knowing possibility is there and the awkwardness of it. And I just, I really enjoyed writing the awkwardness of her without it being, oh, she's an awkward character. She falls down a lot. She's not, <laughs> she's competent at her job, arguably. <laughs> and she does what needs to be done and she sticks with it. But she's just also, yeah. It's, it's just very, very relatable. And I think, I think you did yeah. it brilliantly by I think when she rushes back to the house, you're not at first sure whether it's some sort of supernatural catastrophe going on that she just remembered or she just realized he's a werewolf. But no, <laughs> it's just this this social thing that the faux pas that she did. It's like, I love it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, that's the last question on my sheet. I do have a final question for you. And sure. that's... Uh, are there any future projects that you're currently working on that you'd be willing to talk a little about or, or well or not <laughs> there is I'm just thinking a lot of stuff at the moment has either just been announced things I've illustrated for other people or mm -hmm. can't be announced yet so I am going to be working on a longer graphic novel oh. hopefully starting in March but that's going to be a year or two's project okay. I'm really looking forward to it I'm working on it with an author who I've admired for a very long time and done a little bit of work with. And I'm really, I'm really excited about that. It'll be quite interesting approach. I'm not just being given a script. I'm, I'm really looking forward to playing with that. It's something I haven't really done at that length. So that's a, a background, background radiation uh, <laughs> of what I'm doing. I'm working on a novel for the PhD, which mm -hmm. is much more, much closer to, oh, mythic fantasy I'd say rather than mm -hmm. high like it is it's not not high fantasy but it's much closer to that fairy tale based fantasy and it is playing with playing heavily with Robin Hood with some gender flipping as a base as a base for the story but then getting into Tamlin and Sir Orfeo and all of all of that good stuff uh, and and stories and tales within tales and legends and very different from flyaway except that i think of it as a companion piece because it's also made up of stories that have stuck with me for a long time and if flyaway is about living in australia and reading fairy tales and seeing that australian landscape through the lens of fairy tales then the world of the current project called a crown of leaves the world of that project is about having a particular view of England and Europe that comes from fairy tales when you read them from so far away that it's just this microcosm of a green world which is cut off from anywhere outside and which is not at all it's never been it's never been historically accurate like reading history and just the trade routes and the shipping and the, the people are constantly zipping all over the place but I wanted to capture a story that was the way I imagined it all mm -hmm reading it that way before I got more historically accurate also I refuse to be it's definitely got very obvious historical analogs in the story but I refuse to be historically accurate because <laughs> it needs to be set in an era before buttons and coats as we know them now and I'm determined to have coats with big buttons <laughs> I like coats and I like sensible boots <laughs> and I'm putting them in the story which is largely the reason for that and also not wanting to have to be historically rigorous I've got some Regency projects, which I'm going back and forth on putting magic in, but Regency romance. I've got more short story projects in the works. I'm allegedly working on some more novellas, uh, but 
and a PhD and <laughs> workshops and drawing on stuff and reading books and reading through that big box of golden age detective novels. So <laughs> my friend's like you need to say no I'm like but every time I say no to a category of things it opens up more space to do these other things <laughs> I like doing it all. so trying to modulate that I'm a little I'm a little over committed and also running in every direction at the moment working on a really interesting map for a middle grade fantasy at the moment so keep an eye out for that it's it's an intriguing one because again it was dealing with cultural traditions and knowledge that isn't mine and I had to have a number of conversations mm. with the publisher and the author and there have been other artists involved in the project who had the background that I didn't so um, taking direction and getting to spool through possibilities for how to deal with a map based on some of that has been really interesting so that should be announced at some point <laughs> it's due on Tuesday <laughs> so I am going to be doing a lot of inking, finishing that off. So just I think the answer to that question is everything that I possibly can, and it would be great if someone could just lock me in a room at the library for a couple of days until I finish something. <laughs> well, uh, that was a great interview. I had a lot of fun. I hope you did as well. <laughs> I did. Thank you. I had a wonderful time. It was really nice seeing your face and getting to talk to you likewise I had such a great time and thank you for taking taking so much time to talk to me and answer all my questions and you were so detailed it was great fun so thank you thank you thank you it was <laughs> wonderful and if you're ever in a strength. <laughs>